Good morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the seventh week after Pentecost. Thank you for being with me this morning. Our scriptures are Psalm number 65. We're going to finish Numbers chapter 22 and get into the first part of 23. And we'll finish Romans chapter 7 today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own, in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the Word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. That brings us to our psalm. Psalm number 65. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Let us pray. Lord God, joy marks your presence. Beauty, abundance, and peace are the tokens of your work in all creation. Work also in our lives that by these signs we may see the splendor of your love and may praise you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> our first reading is from the 22nd and 23rd chapters of Numbers. We begin at verse 41. And in the morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to Bamoth Baal, and from there he saw a fraction of the people. And Balaam said to Balak, Build for me seven here, seven altars, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. 
Balak did as Balaam had said. And Balak and Balaam offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went to a bare height, and God met, met Balaam. And Balaam said to him, I have arranged the seven altars, and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returned, returned to him, and behold, he and all the princes of Moab were standing beside his burnt offering. And Balaam, Balaam took up his discourse and said, From Aram, Balak has brought me, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him, from the hills I behold him. Behold a people dwelling alone, and not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. And Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have done nothing but bless them. And he answered and said, Must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So things don't go the way Balak wants them to. He thinks money and power will buy him favor. God has already showed Balaam that's not going to work. And so he uses him for his own purposes. So we skipped just a couple of verses, but it was basically... Um, Balaam went with Balak, went to a specific place called Kiriath Husoth. No, it means city of streets, and it's only mentioned in that one place in all of the Old Testament. So we don't really know where it is. Um, and he sacrificed some oxen and sheep. Um, and then we get to where we are here. And in the morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to another place, Bamoth Baal. From there he saw a fraction of the people. All right, Bamoth Baal, literally the high places of Baal. The actual god involved here, a false god, may be Chemosh, rather the Phoenician Baal, since Baal used, is used for Chemosh among the Earl, the nearby Ammonites. So there's some there's some pagan worship going on here too. Which is, I'm sure, why Balak was not going to win against the people of the God of Abraham. Uh, seeing a fraction, this is a superstitious technique, seemed to require that the curse be uttered from a place where the soothsayer saw his victims. When the attempt failed at this otherwise unknown height, Balak took Balaam to the top of Pisgah, which is in tomorrow's reading yes we'll read that tomorrow finally or yeah and finally to the top of peor so um so balaam sacrificed a bull and a ram on each of seven altars right except for the last instance he left balak and his princes at the altars in order to meet the lord and then return to them with the word of the lord so that's exactly what happened um this this thing about a bear height right so he went to a bear height all right my note here is mountains and hills were wooded in an earlier era that made made stony heights stand out so it was a little bit it was a, a little bit higher and that's where god met balaam told him what he'd done Right, the seven altars and a bull and a, and a ram on each one. Um, 
So, God gives Balaam an unmistakable message. He put a word in Balaam's mouth. I love this. In the Old Testament, it's an, it's like a tangible thing, right? The, the word here is davar, right? But davar means not only word, but thing, okay? It's, you can touch it. You can taste it. He put it in his mouth. So go back to Balak and speak this word that I'm giving you. So he returned to Balak, and he, Balak, and all the princes of Moab were standing beside that, doing exactly what Balaam told him to do. And Balaam took up his discourse. <laughs> so it's time to utter the word he's been given. Okay, so Balak brought me out of Aram and asked me to curse Jacob, to curse Israel and denounce him, right? Um yeah, it basically made a mockery of Balak's sinister intentions. So how can I curse somebody that God hasn't cursed? If God hasn't, if the Lord hasn't denounced them, how can I, how can I denounce them? From the top of the crags, I see him. Yeah. From the hills, I behold him, a people dwelling alone, not counting itself among the nations. Israel is separate and holy and unique from all the other nations of the world, not counting itself. It's not the, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Perizzites. I know that big long list, the Canaanites. Israel is not the same. They're different. They're different because of the Lord. Who can count the dust of Jacob? They're pretty numerous, right? Or number the fourth part of Israel. This is kind of an odd. Yeah, the fourth, the dust clouds, right? Number the fourth part. Hmm. Unfortunately, let's see. Number the dust clouds. Yeah, it's basically just describing how big the nation of, of Israel has become. Let me die the death of the upright. Balaam acknowledged that the Israelites were righteous in God's sight. In his covenant of grace, God had declared them acceptable to him despite their sins. So, <clears throat> Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you've done nothing but bless them. Pretty clear that's what he's done. The poem does not explicitly bless Israel, but Balaam expresses longing to be like them, and he judged them as upright. So, yeah. Not really an outright blessing, but made him look pretty good anyway. So he asked him, must not, must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? You know, are you going to disobey the creator of the universe? Especially when he confronts you and makes your donkey talk, right? Balaam has more to fear from God than he does Balak. All right. Romans, we pick up where we left off yesterday. This is chapter 7. We'll read verses 13 to 25. St. Paul says, Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members 
another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. I know we've all heard this before. Paul, Paul can be pretty thick sometimes, so we're going to break this down. All right. So what he finished with, is the law sin? No, absolutely not. Heck no, right? By no means. So did that which is good, which he's talking about the law, did the law then bring death to me? Did the law do that? No, absolutely not. Because as we saw yesterday, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law, the commandment did not bring death to me. No, absolutely not. Heck no. It was sin that did that. Producing, de producing death in me through what is good, the law. Okay. Sin, once I'm aware of the law, sin, which caused me to rebel against the law, earned me death. Sin earned me death, right? Producing death in me through what is good, the law, in order that sin might be shown to be sin. This is what the law does. The law says, that's sin. Look at yourself. That's the mirror, right? Sorry, imagine a mirror in my hand, right? <clears throat> and through the commandment, might become sinful beyond measure. Okay. Sin is not inconsequential. We are not to excuse our sins. We are completely sinful. Okay. For we know that the law is spiritual. It is of divine origin. I'm not. I'm of the flesh. Right? Part of the fallen world. Sold under sin. Okay. So, a couple of notes here. Living in the flesh means controlled by sin. We talked about that yesterday. All right. I'm going to go back to this other note. All the way at the beginning of, of, the, of the Old Testament. Ah, we're in 101. Okay, this is talking about slavery in the Bible. Held captive, right? Paul's advice. Let's see. Yeah, all right, that's way too long. Okay, so... So yesterday we talked about one way to be freed from the law was to um, for your owner to die, for the person to whom you were captive to die. And he likened it to marriage. Another way is to be sold, right? To be bought. <laughs> All right. So sold under sin i'm of the flesh sold under sin that's who owned me for i don't understand my own actions i do not do what i want but i do the very thing i hate i want to be righteous but i do the thing that i hate all right so as a christian paul is telling us that he struggles with his sinful na sinful nature he has sinful desires but knows they're wrong he tries to avoid sin but inevitably fails even as a Christian, he cannot overcome sin by his own efforts. This is Paul. He struggles with it. So it's okay if we do too, because it's normal. It's not good, but this is who we are as fallen sinful people. It starts by acknowledging that we're follow, fallen sinful people. Now, if I do what I do not want, right? the very thing I hate. I agree with the law that it is good. All right, where's he going with this? This is kind of weird. 
All right. And of course, it skips that. Here's what Luther says. Both expressions are true. Even he tries to avoid sin, but inevitably fails. And even as a Christian, he can't overcome sin by his efforts. Both expressions are true that he himself does it, and he himself does not do it. He's like a horseman. When his horses do not trot the way he wants them to, it is he himself, yet not he himself, who makes the horse run in such and such a way. For the horse is not without him, and he is not without the horse. But because a carnal man certainly consents to the law of his members, he certainly himself does what sin does. I don't know if that helped either. Let's keep going. It's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Okay. It's the sin in me that's making me do the thing I hate because I am captive to that sin. For I know nothing good dwells in me in my flesh. I know that, right? Because being flesh means being ruled by sinful passions. I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. Why? Because the flesh is weak. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Paul struggles with sin. Even as a baptized and redeemed apostle of Jesus Christ, Paul struggles with sin. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Okay, he is repeating himself. Now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. It is, he has repeated himself for emphasis. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Think about that for a second. This is a regular occurrence. Whenever Paul attempts good, he still sins. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Spiritually, I know that God's law is good for me. I delight in God's law. But I see in my members, in my flesh, another law waging war against the law of my mind, right? In my inner being, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. My flesh is weak. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. That's where he's going, right? Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death, his own fleshly body that is trying to lead him down the path of death instead of eternal life? Who will deliver me? I need a savior. This is where the gospel takes over from the law. The gospel says you need a savior because you that's the mirror has shown you that you can't do it yourself. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's who will deliver me from this body of death. So then. I myself serve the law of God with my mind, what I want to do. With my flesh, I serve the law of sin. It's that inner conflict. <sighs> Our struggle with sin is not a past event. It is a present reality. We know God's will and desire to serve him, but we cannot overcome sin. Even if we try, we fail. We cry out, who will deliver me from this body of death? We say that too. There is only one answer. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus rescues us. Though we sin daily, he continues to forgive and restore us. Thanks be to God. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. 
in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, Lord, that the course of this world may be so governed by your direction that your church may rejoice in serving you in godly peace and quietness. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. We're going to skip to the end. Let us pray. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. That concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, we will do our best to maintain this schedule this week. So I thank you for getting back into the groove with me. <laughs> and uh, we'll continue to uh, get back into God's word. So thank you for being here. I hope the rest of your day is blessed until we can be together again, whenever that is. May God bless and keep you.